This is Talk It Out, the Women's Agenda podcast. Tune in for your weekly download on the latest news, trends and ideas affecting your career or your business. Here's your host, Angela Priestley. Hello and welcome to Talk It Out. I am here in the studio with uh, Georgie Dent, our lead contributing editor on Women's Agenda. How are you, Georgie? I'm very well, thank you, today. And also Marina Go, a leading board director, who is already laughing, I believe, at our awesome music. Yep, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> I might add that Marina was also a, uh, our founding, edit- uh, founding publisher on Women's Agenda, and the three of us have shared an office before as we are sharing the studio at the moment, Eagle Wave Studio at Vivo Cafe on George Street. Um, so, <clears throat> big episode of uh, Talk It Out today. <laughs> we are going to be talking about contrast in diversity because we have seen a lot of them in the past few days. And secondly, a really important topic, we will be talking about staying well at work, what we can do, some of the stats around that, um, what each of us do to try and stay well as well. So um, just a reminder that Women's Agenda, we do go out every day for free. We're a newsletter that goes out just before lunchtime and we help you stay smart and get savvy. We share career advice and of course we also share news relevant to career-minded women across politics, technology, business, life and various other things as well. So to start with uh, diversity, so three years ago when asked why he'd un- unveiled a cabinet that was 50% female, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau responded because it's 2015. So now it's 2018 and uh, we're still finding that a 50-50 split is quite rare in the cabinets of governments on company boards, in the leadership of tech companies, even on the panels of major conferences and events. Uh, So much so that when Spain's uh, new Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez unveiled a majority female cabinet, he received uh, international praise from some, but also uh, some uh, questionable uh, comments from other people as well, which we might get to. So, Georgie, Mm. why can some boards, some Prime Ministers, some associations, some conference organisations manage to find the women? And some cannot. Well, I think the simple answer is that if you have got the will or the determination, if you are of the view that diversity is a priority, then it is absolutely doable. And I think that's what we see. I mean, you know, Justin Trudeau, I I think, you know, his comment was so powerful. Unfortunately, three years on, it still remains sort of idealistic for a lot of other countries. But I think when you have your objective as finding a diversity and having, you know, broad representation on in your decision making group it is absolutely possible to achieve that mm. what do you think marina oh look i agree with georgie and i think um there are three there are three groups from what i've from my experience of approaching um diversity and there's definitely the closed group so people who don't believe that women are as capable as men and there are people like that still unfortunately i know it's hard to believe it's 2018 but there are some groups like that some boards even Um, and then there's another group that absolutely believe in it and um, strategically ensure that they're getting closer to 50% so they actually plan it and are going out of their way to uh, to choose capable women and then there's another group which I think is a wonderful group and it's where we all like to get to eventually it's where we need to get to Um, and happily a lot of these are men who were who think like this who just really want the best people. And so, you know, I've experienced panels, boards, uh, other other groups that should be diverse, um, where you do find sometimes even a majority of women, but certainly um, certainly as close to balance as you would you would happily want. Um, and when when you question people about why that happens, there's this wonderful I just got the best people and that's exactly the way it should be. Um, Unfortunately, we're not there yet with everyone, so you, so the strategic group is really important for us, um, and and we really need to go hard on the ones who are close to it. So um, that's the experience I've had, the three different groups. Do we need to go hard on the ones that are close to it, or is it a case of just a lost cause? Well, some of them are a lost cause. You know, I mean, I've had a number of discussions <laughs> um, with people who just who will actually say to me, 
Oh, well, it's really hard for men because, you know, all the women are getting our board positions and, and I go, what, well, you know, like the three women out of ten and the, against seven men, but you're angry about the three women. Um, and so, but, they, but even in a discussion that could go for an hour of me trying to explain what is the obvious, um, these people walk away closed. So I think it's difficult. It's really difficult. Um, I keep thinking that time, unfortunately, it's, you know, you believe that they'll die out, which sounds horrible, but literally die out. Um, but the impact that they have on the next generation you, is undeniable, right? So it's still a role modeling thing in, in organizations or people that are close to men and women. It's not just men. Okay. We know that it's just, mm. there are some women as well who are pretty close to it, um, you often find that people around them who admire them start to think like that and and so it becomes a problem within that group so that's why I think we can't completely leave them alone mm. uh, but we have to acknowledge that it's going to take a bit longer but let's not we can't give up and what mm. if they have daughters will that help <laughs> oh yeah you know the daughter thing though I have to say can I tell you a really wonderful little story quickly about this so the daughter thing annoys a lot of women. So I spoke at an event recently, women in mining, and they invited me to speak about, you know, because I'm a woman sitting on a board, chairing a board in a, in a very difficult male-dominated environment, so they wanted uh, me as a case study. And, um, and I was talking about how men with daughters are much, much clearer about this. Mm. And a couple of the women got, you know probably fairly quite angry about it and they and they said you know we're sick of hearing all the daughter stuff because it should it shouldn't ha you shouldn't have to have a daughter mm. in order to think you know they've got wives they've got mothers they've got you know they they are surrounded by women they shouldn't have to have had a daughter because what happens then we go oh it's okay he doesn't have a daughter so that's why he doesn't th so mm. we're making excuses for men who don't have daughters so i was i've got um thankfully three fabulous chairmen on three of the boards where i have chairmen and um one of them, we were having a discussion about uh, our diversity plans. So, you know, we, obviously on all the boards that I'm on, we have a desire to bring more women into the organisation. And in this particular occasion, um, one of the executives said, OK, well, I'll put a business plan together for why we need more women. And the chairman, thank God, said, that's bullshit. Why should, why should a woman have to have... Why do we need a business plan for women? We don't have business plan for men. So why should we have to put a business plan together? It's the right thing to do. There are great women out there. Just go and get them. And that's absolutely where we need to get to because, again, mm. very senior women, you, you hear them all the time. You know, they're, they're some of the most senior female directors and chairmen, female chairmen, will talk about business, you know, what's the business case? Yes. We've got to make yeah. sure there's a business case. And... And, you know, that's quite right. We don't do the same for the men. Mm. So, again, mm. what are we doing? Mm. Mm. So, anyway, sorry. I, I think also <laughs> in the context, uh, Georgie, we published a piece this week, um, an amazing piece by two female surgeons, and they're two of... It's something like 750 female surgeons in Australia, which mm. I think that number just sounds just astounding. It's mm. unbelievable. But mm. they are actually responding to a piece in the Daily Mail in the UK that published a best of list of for the, the 20 best knee replacement surgeons in the mm. UK, and they were all white and they were all male. And their point in the piece was, well, what are we looking at when we say the best? Because if you go and ask for recommendations from other people who are already perceived to be the best, then they're probably going to suggest people like themselves. Mm. And they pointed to all the other examples and the business case for, for diversity around what would mean the best in that context. So, I mean, Georgie, why would something like... I guess the media in the context of these best of lists, how do, they, how do we still manage to get it so wrong? Well, I think it's. I think it goes to the the sort of angle in which you are looking at things from. Because I think when I saw that list of you know the twenty best knee replacement surgeons in the UK, and you can't help but notice that they're all middle aged, they're all white, they're all men. And my my thinking there is no one is looking at this with the lens on of what what are we saying about this group? Because I think that list just perpetuates it's exactly the same when you go to a conference and it's headlined, you know, dominated by men, when there's, you know, 15 top guest speakers and 14 of them are men and there's one woman and usually she's facilitating the panel. It just perpetuates the idea that, to, that the best or that the leaders in any field look like this. This is what they look like. And we, in so many different industries, in so many different ways, we are sold that message that these, this is what the best looks like. So there are probably lots of people out there who just genuinely believe to be a good CEO, you have to be middle-aged man. The same with, with surgeons, the same with politicians, because that's just what we have seen. And I think 
the point that the two female surgeons make very powerfully is that there are all sorts of different options out there, but not everyone has got equal visibility. And, I mean, surgery is, the numbers are extreme. You know, it is such a boys' club here in Australia. I think, I mean, I think females, I know that number is 760, but I think it is less than 5% of all surgeons mm. are females. So they make up a tiny, tiny percentage. Um, and, and so they do have a huge job ahead of them in terms of carving out, well, actually, this is also what a surgeon looks like. Mm. Um, and there has been an incredible, I think, one of, a great social media movement that started from... It was a cover of the... I look like a the, surgeon. No, the, I look yeah, like the a I look like a surgeon yeah. hashtag. Yeah. But it came from... A New Yorker that cover. A New Yorker cover of the, you know, that image in the operating theatre of surgeons. And I think things like that are actually powerful because it does, if you click on and have a look through that hashtag, surgeons are not all white, male, middle-aged men. Mm. Um, and we just have to constantly challenge that, I think. This is a commercial break for Work It Out. We'll be back in a moment. But if you're interested in being a sponsor for Work It Out or Women's Agenda, just drop us a line and let us know. That's womensagenda.com.au. Okay, well, we might move on to our second topic. Um, So we wanted to look at uh, staying well at work. And I think if there's one thing that we've really learnt over the past few weeks, it's that uh, no amount of career success or high-profile achievements can really protect you from... A mental illness um, or from anxiety, depression and suicide and that's particularly true with the deaths of um, Anthony Bourdain recently along with fashion designer Kate Spade. Um, and so recent research by uh, uh, Jean Hales found that 40% of women aged 18 to 80 have expressed, this is in Australia, have expressed that they had a diagnosable history of anxiety and or depression and large, a large percentage said that they had the tendency to worry excessively about different things. Uh, they also found that healthy sleep patterns were at a concerning low and they saw a link between women's increased anxiety and a lack of physical activity with busy women between the ages of 18 and 35 being more likely to report at least mild levels of anxiety. Another thing on the physical um, exercise part is that they found that 60% of us are not completing the recommended 2.5 hours of moderate physical activity a week. And um, with that, I guess a lot of it comes down to time. Uh, Marina, do you think it's possible to uh, manage your health, both physically and mentally, if you, oh, I guess, <laughs> at a point when women, when we're, still, we're having families and we're still we're trying to pursue big careers and big ambitions, and I guess, what can we do? It's hard. I mean, it's obviously difficult because um, people are squeezed for time a lot more than before. You know, most people have less... Uh, work, work with less people around them so actually have to do twice as much. I think that's something that you know people are not really recognising this is an issue. Mm. Um, because you know in the past you, you saw groups of women um, going for walks at lunchtime together for example and, and now um, now it's hard to have time for lunch. So you know where do you, how can you go for a walk if you uh, have, you know you need to um, clear your head, and get out there and think. It's really difficult. But um, I, you know, uh, the way that I always used to do it when I was working full time um, was I would make sure that at least once a week I had a couple of, you know, buddies at work. And I think, you know, um, that helps you in terms of your mental health and finding your group at work. And and we would go for a sneaky glass of champagne at the end of the day, you know, not every day, obviously, <laughs> like once a week, um, almost to to treat ourselves but also because we needed that connection we needed to change our thinking we need to speak about something else and so even if we were just talking about the latest dress or something we'd read in a trash magazine it didn't matter but we needed to change the conversation and stop thinking about the issues that were troubling us at work because every business is disrupted everyone you know most people are doing it tough in you know even in large organizations because their little part of the business isn't making as much money or is having to do more with less um, but I think you have to consciously plan for it in your day. It's tough, though. It's, it's you know, mm. I don't think there's an easy solution. Mm. Georgie, do you have any tips or what, what do you do to, to, I guess, stay on top of things when things can be quite overwhelming as a parent, um, managing many different things in your career as well, and also factoring in technology and social media, which is at you constantly? Yeah, I mean, I think those dynamics... It's hard to counter that. I mean, because I think the reality is in 
in almost every field in any organisation, we are people are expected to do a lot more than they used to do with a lot less resources. We've also got, and we've talked about this before, we've got technology now that means we can take work home with us. We can we can take social media home with us. We can take. Um, I mean, there really is no definite beginning and end point of your working day. No, we can Unless, open up the phone at three o'clock in the morning and exactly. check the emails and social media, which yeah. is not a good idea. And I mean, I wouldn't want to sit here and pretend that I am someone that has got this balance right, because I don't think that I always do. Um, I think that I, being predisposed to anxiety, which I definitely am, I have to be really, really disciplined. Um, and I'm, look, some weeks I'm better at that than others. I think sometimes having, you know, in some ways having, you know, for example, I've got three children. So they're three very real distractions that have got all sorts of needs that are not limited to, you know, working hours or waking hours. And in some ways I think that helps me yeah. because I'm forced to switch off from work at a, at a lot of regular points. And mm-hmm. I think it actually, for me, it does help bring perspective. In another way, though, you do actually, I mean, I find with the kids, there's certainly as the girls are getting older, there's also sort of emotional stuff that you're navigating, that it's not just, you know, I mean, it's not just a two-year-old, you know, I've got a two-year-old as well, so I'm very much in that zone of with someone who just constantly wants to say, no, me do, me do, and you're managing that, which is physically quite demanding. But I've also got, with, with the older kids, when they're starting school and you're managing their friendships and, you know, trying to help them guide through that stuff, I feel it's also, it's another sort of demand on my capacity and so I think I am constantly aware of the fact that I feel like there's a lot of demands on me and I have to be quite disciplined about how and when I meet those needs mm. and but definitely I'm not a perfect case study and I definitely get it wrong mm. quite often but I think I mean I've said this before for me I have to distance myself from my phone at night um before so what I do you go to do? bed, do you do airport mode or yeah, airport I, I even, mode, airline mode? Airline mode. Yeah, sometimes I do that. I also, I mean, I, I I talk to my husband as well because I feel like then it actually annoys me, and I don't even like saying this out loud, but it makes me accountable. So if I say to him, after nine o'clock, I don't want to be on my phone, then I find mm. that's actually quite useful because he will encourage me to not, or I'll plug my phone in on the other side of the room because I use it as my alarm. Yeah. But I have to be. And if I'm in an okay zone where I'm not particularly stressed out and everything's fine, then I don't even think it's an issue. But it's 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 when I'm in that zone where you are particularly busy or stressed about something that yeah. I find myself looking on my phone. I don't even know what for, but I'm updating my emails, checking different things, and then I find I can't sleep, and then I find you're into a problematic yeah pattern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I do think the other thing is as women. This is a stereotype, but I think, or a generalisation, but I think we too often are waiting for someone to give us permission to look after ourselves. And I think the reality is we have to look after ourselves before we can do anything else. And so things like, and I know how tricky it is because when you look at the limited number of hours in a day, mm. and I know, I know how much paid and unpaid work women are doing, I know there's hardly any time, but if you don't make time for yourself, but whether that's exercise, whether that's meditation, whether it's you know going for a massage or going out with your girlfriends, doing mm. those sorts of fun things, then it will all fall apart because mm. you can't be everything to everyone else without having something in your own tank. Mm. Yeah, Gillian Michaels of yes. The Biggest Loser. Yes, um, <laughs> I've actually is, got some of her exercise routines. But when, when she's, <laughs> uh, I think she's amazing. So yeah, she's she um, uh, she's obviously a business owner, a mom, and a big celebrity in the US and clearly very fit and managing her health but is very open and honest about where she struggles but she has this uh, tip that we just take 12 hours out of our week uh, which can sound like a lot but when you think that we've got around 110 waking hours if we take 112 say waking hours if we take 12 hours that still leaves 100 hours for for work for family for um, mm. house whatever it else it is but if you can take that 12 hours and carve it out to do a bit of exercise uh, to see a friend to make the medical appointment whatever it is you need then that's quite a sustainable approach to it so and also it takes out the idea that you have to do all these things every day if you look over it over the course of a week mm. you can try and find that time mm. over the course of a week as opposed to necessarily trying to find the time every day which a lot of you know self-help books say that you need to find the time every day but I think that that's often targeted yeah, at, at maybe men and yeah. not necessarily at women who might have children or might have something else going on and waking up at five o'clock in the morning and doing your half hour of power exercise is just not a realistic no. option mm. um, for, for everyone. Mm. Um, so I, I guess one final thing, Marina, a yes. question on that. I wanted to ask about social media. If, yep. 
um, when we talk about high rates of anxiety, particularly in young women, do you think mm. that social media is having an impact and do we need to try and share uh, more strategies to, to manage it? And it's not so much trolls. I mean, I think that's mm. an extreme end. Sometimes yeah. it's just seeing the perfect edited version of other people's lives that um, yeah. doesn't necessarily correlate with mm. uh, what is reality. Yeah, look, I think... Uh, look. It's always been an issue for women anyway because before we had social media delivering a perfect world, we had magazines delivering a perfect world and the Mm. teenagers are no longer reading the magazines and now on social media. So it's kind of replaced it. I think the difference though is that at least there was some understanding it was some it was a perfect world because it you know it wasn't your friends being reflected or other girls like you or mm. that were your age. Mm. I think that's the problem with social media. So you know when you look around it's like me I look at my my Instagram feed and I see Cindy Crawford and and Christy Turlington and they go they still look absolutely gorgeous they're the same age as me. Um, their lives are perfect but I expect them to be. But when I see other women that are kind of like me that I vaguely know and their lives are really perfect too and then you start to go, oh, God, you know, mm. how does my life compare? You know, have, am I doing enough? You know, so I think the teenage version of that um, provides an element of stress and anxiety at, a, at exactly the right time when girls don't need it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> They've got yeah. so many other things in their lives. Um, and, and again, the problem is that none of their lives are perfect uh, and if they were able to be more honest, then they would probably all be much happier yeah. um, and still have something to say on, on Instagram. So, it's, you know, look, it's a hard one, Angela. I mean, I, mm. I think, as I said to you, I, I don't think it's different to the perfect world that we've always set up for people. Mm. Except um, that maybe there was a boundary in that. There was a boundary, world. exactly. Yeah. I think I read a really interesting piece. Um, I think it was in the Telegraph, the British Telegraph, by one of the fashion writers there, Lisa Armstrong, who is actually she's a great writer. And she was writing about the time that she had met and interviewed Kate Spade. And basically the piece is about the danger of the facade of perfection. Mm. Because, I mean, I think when, you know, news of, of Kate Spade's death and by suicide really does... You know, she is, if you look at it on paper, you would think, how could this person not be happy? You know, she had this incredibly successful business, um, you know, a business that other people would absolutely dream of and, you know, a, a daughter and all of this stuff that you would think would make people happy. And I think the fact that she was in that world just brings home all of that stuff, all of our ex- expectations around well, if, some, if something looks perfect, then it is perfect. And I think that's one of the problems with social media is that you fall into that subconsciously. You look at what people post, and I agree with you, Marina, it is because it's people that are actually like you. I mean, I feel less... I mean, I don't even follow Miranda Kerr, but if I was to follow her on Instagram or if I see her photos, I I don't feel any... There's no comparison. Of course, that's a different world. But when it's friends or peers and you see how perfect their houses are or how perfect their hair always is, and it does make you feel inadequate in a way that I think it doesn't when it's aspirational mm. Mm. but I do I think for women there is we are still so caught up in the imperfection and I mean maybe men are as well but I do think that that is a problem and I think mm. social media sort of amplifies that impact mm. Mm. Yep. and when you're already short of time as well yes mm. there's there's one place that maybe <laughs> you could help in terms of finding a little bit more time I know and we're all I do think <laughs> most of us are better off for culling a little bit of time spent on social media and I put myself in that Me too. Yeah. category. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Sitting there going through stories on Instagram probably you might be better off sleeping. Yes. I know. <laughs> Particularly, yeah. I find it quite funny because my husband's not on Instagram. If he ever hops into bed or sits on the couch next to me and I'm looking at Instagram stories and he's like, who even are these people? And I'm like, I actually barely, I don't even know. Don't it's know. just a random <laughs> person that I follow and he's like, and you listen to them talk and, about and, their life. And the Instagram yes, people do. have made it especially addictive that you keep on swiping. Yeah, so, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So with that, we might end on our final thing that we are talking about this week. So a film, mm. a book, a podcast, whatever mm. it is. Georgie. Oh, I knew you were going to come to me first. We can I? go to Marina. Yeah. <laughs> All right. actually, actually, do you know what? Yeah. I will say this. Um, <laughs> back in time for dinner. Has anyone been watching that? Annabelle no. Crabbe's ABC oh, show. I miss it. I okay, miss it. I didn't watch it from the start, but I've now caught up and I've watched two episodes and I'm absolutely hooked. They have done the casting and the production so well. Mm. Basically watching this family 
go back through the ages of different decades. Yeah. And I can't, I mean, initially, I look, I love Annabelle Crabbe, like probably everybody else on the planet. But when I first read about the concept, I was sort of a bit unsure of how it would come together. Of course, I watched it and I was like, well, of course it's come off like this. But it's actually incredibly compelling viewing. Yeah, it's very. They put a lot into it, changing the the house. Yeah, rebuilding the house. I've only for each seen decade. certain parts of it, and I found. Um, uh, the, the 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 mother. I assume it is a, a yeah, no, family. Is, They're not cast actual, separately, but no. um, she's brilliant. Uh, yeah. yeah, and the kids are really interesting as well. I think it's mm. yeah, and seeing her trying like just having to. I, I saw part of the fifties episode and seeing her having to navigate as a fifties housewife after she's had this career and she ends up sort of boxed in this kitchen and they, you know, they they have the house planned out so that the kitchens weren't open. The the, the housewife was sort of locked in there and she'd spend her day pretty much in there because. Uh, doing the dishes, doing the laundry, whatever it is, was so time-consuming. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. No, I, so I recommend it. All right. Any recommendations from you, Marina? Yes. Yeah, so I saw Ocean's 8 oh. on Saturday night, and it is yeah. so fantastic. And I think the reason – I mean, I, I was going to see it anyway because I love – you know, that for me is that gloss, yummy love. Yeah. Um, but the concept of these powerful women, these amazing women who just carry this show – and Kate Blanchett, everything she wears. So that's all I have to say. Everything she wears, but it's brilliant. It's clever. Um, you know, I watched most of the uh, the male versions because you know I'm a bit of a George Clooney fan. Um, and this, the, the female version, is so much better than all of it. It's just brilliant. So I recommend that you go and see it. I'm not surprised okay. that it's it's the number one in the box office apparently mm. in America. Yep. Yeah, didn't First take weekend. long. So, so yeah, no, and which again shows you women can sell tickets. So yep. you know there was this whole thing: why are there enough women uh, getting leads? Why are they not getting yep. paid as much yep. as men? Well, yep. this should blow it all away. So it's come out ahead of the male led. Absolutely. Version. Yep. in its opening weekend. Exactly. So pay women the same as men, if not more, actually, because they're making more money. Yeah. <laughs> so mine this week is a little short film put together by uh, Destiny's Pictures. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yes, presented it's... like a film trailer that uh, Donald Trump uh, oh. took along to his meeting in Singapore to... Uh, <laughs> present to Kim Jong-un and uh, Georgie's written about it today or at least featured the film in her piece today asking what is leadership now really if I this mean, is it, it. Is. Um, if you haven't seen it go and find it on YouTube it has been released officially by the White House we've watched it multiple tri- times we cannot believe it is not satire um, little montage there's little pieces of uh, so basically saying how you know of 7 billion people that uh, these two leaders have the opportunity to really make the world great to make them up. I mean honestly and that's the appeal that he's taken to the North Korean leader which really I think uh, it, it, says look, a it lot. says a lot but I think like you Angela I did hear a section of it being played on mm. ABC Radio National this morning and I honestly did think it was a mm. spoof yeah, like you just when you listen to the voiceover and then when you wow. see, I mean, look, mm. seek it out. It is worth the, um, yeah, it's worth the, the watch. Absolutely. So thank you, Marina. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you thank to you. Eagle Wave Studio and Vivo Cafe for having us once again. Uh, you can subscribe on iTunes and leave a review, and of course, uh, subscribe to our free daily newsletter. We go out every lunchtime. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. a wrap for Talk It Out, the Women's Agenda podcast, powered by Eagle Waves Radio. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and jump on the website for more amazing shows. Catch you next time.